basically all waiting? Yes. Okay. So Hello, everyone. You... <laughs> welcome, welcome. We'll just give everyone a few minutes to uh, join, and then we'll, we'll begin with Louis Brault from Chateau Saint-Con. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Hi. Welcome everyone yeah, keep and just... welcome to our, our interview, our conversation really uh, more than an interview with uh, Louis Perrault, uh, one of the great uh, producers uh, in the Rhone Valley in France, really one of the great vignerons of France. Uh, and it's just a, really a pleasure to, um, to have this opportunity to spend an hour with Louis from the, the winery in Gigandas. So this is going to be great. Um, my name is Jesse Becker. Uh, I'm a master sommelier and I also uh, work for Craft and Estate. Uh, Craft and Estate is an import uh, division of Winebow. Uh, and uh, we are the importer of uh, Chateau saint Combe here in the, the United States. Um, and uh, we, we have some uh, really special um, wines to taste today. In fact, we're debuting a wine, a new wine for the U.S. market uh, in our tasting today. Uh, we want to cover a lot of topics, but I think what I'll do to begin is to um, let Louis Barol say a few words, introduce uh, himself, and um, explain to us uh, this wonderful estate of Chateau Saint-Combe as well as uh, Chateau Rouen. Welcome, Louis. So, hello, uh, everyone. I, uh, I can't see you with my eyes, but I can see you with my heart. So, uh, I, I hope we have a good, uh, a good hour together. I, I, I know you have, uh, uh, s uh, most of you have uh, several wines uh, to taste uh, tonight and enjoy the, this, this conversation. Obviously, um, uh, one hour is, is very, very short to uh, cover uh, many uh, subjects. Uh, so I'll be uh, more than happy to answer to your questions. And if your questions kind of uh, lead this uh, time together, it's, uh, it's probably um, a good idea. And, it, um, and on top of this, it makes my job uh, easier. So please, uh, please don't be shy, uh, ask, ask many, as many questions. Um, as you like, and, uh, and we're, we're going to have a, a good hour together. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, presentation of, of, of the, the, the estates. Uh, maybe, both. maybe we will start with uh, Chateau saint Combe, Louis, and I just wanted to mention, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but if you have a question, type a question in the Q&A. Uh, you can see there's a Q&A at the top of your screen. Type your question there and we'll try to get to your questions throughout the presentation. Uh, Louis, sorry, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I want you to introduce St. Combe. No, sorry, I, I had uh, interrupted you uh, already with the sound of the cork going out of the bottle. So uh, we will interrupt a lot tonight. Um, yeah, so uh, the, 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 the image you see is the, the dejection cone of uh, the Saint-Combe Valley, which is a, a, a pretty great geological phenomenon from the, the Miocene times. The estate uh, is a very historical estate built originally by the, the Romans and, uh, and developed by my family from the 15th century. Uh, to the, the, the modern times. So I am technically the, 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 the 15th generation of uh, wine growers uh, at saint -Com. That's five, uh, five centuries of, uh, of history, but, but it's, it's not, probably not as major as, um, as the, the quality of the terroir, because at saint -Com, we are very, very lucky to have a, a really top-notch um, terroir to deal with. So I really like this photo taken uh, with a drone because it, it really shows the valley and the, the geographical um, uh, situation of saint -Com. All these vineyards you see are ours. So you can see it's geographically very, very homogeneous, but in terms of soil, 
it's easy to understand by watching this that it's very, very uh, heterogeneous. Because of the Dantel de Montmirail, this uh, limestone mountains that lies just behind the estate, you don't see them on this photo, you see them on other photos later. They really destroyed the cake, the geological cake in the, in the Miocene times. And all the materials came down by erosion in this valley, which is a, a geologically speaking, a dejection cone. And it gives this incredible blend of limestone and marl from a uh, Miocene and, and Tortonian. Um, the Tortonian soil explain why Sankom tastes very differently from other Gigondas, because you find Tortonian just at Sankom in the Southern Rhone. And uh, you should know that Tortonian soil is the soil you widely find in Barolo and Barbaresco. So we have in common uh, the soil with this fantastic uh, region in Italy. So um, yeah, deal, deal with such a place uh, really obliges me to uh, give the best, do well, do no mistake, be creative, work hard. It's, it's, it's really, uh, it's a kind of a pressure. I mean, you cannot, you cannot just say, Oh, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna make good wine. I will be okay, etc. No, you you have to be. Uh, um, uh, you, you have to deserve this uh, this place. So it's really important. You can go to the next next photo, Jesse, please. Yes, Louis. We're looking at uh, 15 hectares here. This is the total of vineyard planted at uh, Saint Com. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, Saint Com Gigondas is 15 hectares. This is basically the, the historical vineyard uh, as it was in the 15th century. It did not, not move. You can see that the big buildings in the center of the photo is actually the estate seen from the, 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 the sky. Uh, and then since I took over in 92, I have added some uh, Codron vines, which make uh, Les Deux Albion. And I have planted uh, Les Deux Albion white in fast, fantastic uh, limestone soils, but this is relatively recent uh, uh, when you watch the long history of the estate. So yes, the historical vineyard is 15 hectares, and now it's 30 hectares with 15 of Gigondas wines. So that's a, that's yes, a I general view of the... I was, I just, I bring up the size of the estate because not only do you have this limestone base, this is the, the base soil of Shikandas Appalachian, but also, as you mentioned, Tortonian soil uh, in some parts. There's a, there's a very sandy soil that's um, very similar to what you might find like at Chateau Reyes and Chateau Neuf de Pop. Exactly. Uh, and it's, yeah. it's just a remarkable how in such a small area, it's so geologically complex. Yeah, and this is why you, you really can only manage saint uh, like, like like a Burgundian estate. Uh, you cannot go uh, the Bordeaux way, which is basically, okay, we have basically one soil on 70 hectares, and we are going to co-ferment all of that because it makes sense. Uh, in Gigon, in, in saint Crom, what makes sense is, is vinify separately everything. Uh, because there is interest with everything. Um, so you see the Tortonian, I mean, behind the, the, the estate, you see the, the chapel on the hill. Uh, uh, this is the Sancom Chapel, which was built in the 12th uh, century. And uh, uh, the, the vines around the chapel are the Tortonian uh, vineyards. So basically, uh, if one day you taste... Uh, our Gigondas Liodi called Le Post. Le Post comes from, uh, from this area around the chapel. And this is, this is made out of uh, Tortonian soil. It makes this wine very different from, uh, from others. Um, yeah. And since uh, you took over in 1992, um, I know you've changed many things uh, at the estate. Uh, you, was it you or was it actually your father who converted Saint Combe to organic and eventually biodynamic? 
Well, uh, until the 80s, nobody or almost in the world was talking about organic and even less biodynamic. It was not existing, um, but my, uh, the idea of my father was just uh, to love the nature. Uh, in 72, 73, when the chemical products arrived in my region, he tried, obviously, he tried like uh, every single farmer tried at the, at the time, uh, because at the time nobody was talking about pollution and uh, carbon impact, uh, problems of chemical agriculture, etc. It was, it was a non-existing subject. But my father had, had always been a, a deep lover of uh, birds, which I am as well. We deeply love nature. And he tried the, the insecticides in uh, 72, 73, and he has seen the populations of birds go down uh, quite uh, terribly because the mothers, they take the, the worms, which has been sprayed with insecticides, they take this to feed the babies and the babies die and every year the population go down uh, because of that so when when he saw that he decided to uh, to stop chemical products forever but it was not it was not to go it was not about clean farming and it was not about making an organic wine it was a deep true love of nature and then when you when you when you begin to make wine like i began in 92 uh, you suddenly realize that this attitude becomes an incredible asset for your quality for your winery because you deal with an untouched vineyard and it makes a big difference i mean uh, if you convert a vineyard from uh, from conventional to uh, organic, it really takes time to uh, go to the point you get the purity of the, the, the cleanness of the soil, etc. But, but when you've had that forever, it's, uh, it's, it's pre-existent to your work. So this is why um, uh, you cannot really talk about yourself much when you deal with such an estate. It's, it's a collective work. Uh, but it's, it's a collective work in the long time, in the long term, in the long uh, history. I, I, was just, I just realized uh, yesterday that your anniversary for purchasing Chateau Rouen uh, is May 27th, 2019, which is tomorrow. So it's your one year anniversary of owning oh, Rouen. Oh, yes! I didn't know! <laughs> Thank you, JC. So happy, <laughs> it's good, happy good anniversary. Good. And <laughs> would you tell us about Thank this uh, this new property that you've you've acquired in Vansoub, which is thirty kilometers to the north of uh, Gigandas? Uh, it is a fantastic estate, and I can tell you're you're very passionate about this new new estate that you've acquired. Yeah, yeah. You know, I am I am so busy that uh, I had no time to think about uh, about this. So thank you, thank you for, for reminding. Yeah, so this property that you can see uh, uh, on this photo is a, 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 a totally an exceptional uh, piece of property. Uh, we used to buy um, some wine from this property for our Negos uh, Cote du Rhone. And uh, so I've been knowing the potential, the incredible potential of this place for, for a long time. And the two years ago, it was uh, for sale and I, I had kind of a priority and we decided to go for it because we couldn't really leave this place go in, uh, in bad hands. Um, and now it has become a, a, a new passion for me, and it's what is great is that Rouen is a very historical estate as well. Uh, you can see the chateau on the on the photo. Just behind the chateau, there's again a Roman a, a Roman site, just like Sancom, uh, which is classified. 
and uh, and Rouen has been uh, built by the family the Veron in the medieval times. It was totally burnt during the French Revolution uh, and rebuilt in uh, 1830. So basically, what you see is a uh, is the 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 place rebuilt in 1830 after the the, the dark times of the the revolution. Um, what is fantastic is that all the slope, I, I say it again, all the slope that you can watch on this photo, mostly behind the castle, is our property. What you see is 62 hectares. Uh, 40 of these 62 are Vinsobre Cru, because Vinsobre is classified like Gigondas, Chateauneuf, Hermitage, and Cotroti. It's not as known as uh, these ones, but this is the same level of classification. And this slope behind the castle uh, makes a, a totally exceptional wine. This is a, a, a limestone emal from a Pliocene. So this has been generated by a, by a river um, eight million years ago. And, uh, um, and this is a, a, a fantastic vineyard of uh, 50 years old average age as the vineyard was mostly planted in the in the 60s 70s so this is only selection massal no clones and you see that the geo geographical profile uh, looks like burgundy i mean if you go to uh, claude de tar or claude de lambre you have the slope and at the bottom of the slope you have these nice buildings and it talks about how was the viticulture in France in, in the 16th, 17th, 18th century. Um, there is plenty of springs there that, that supply the castle and, and, the, and the cellars with the natural water. We don't have the water from the town. It's only natural springs. So everything is crazy at Rouen in a great way. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I hope you'll, you'll, you'll love the wine. What, what I, what you should do, um, I have written a good piece of uh, text in the brochure uh, 2020 that we have uh, given as widely as we could. Please read, read this text because I really took the time to, uh, to explain as well as I could the, uh, the history and the, and the geographical and geological interest, uh, exceptional interest of uh, this place. So that's a view from down the, the, the chateau. All this, all this piece of land that you see is Mourvedre. So that, that, that's four hectares of Mourvedre in one piece. It's crazy because in saint I, I was used to deal with uh, quite small uh, parcels, 15 hectares, uh, and now I deal with the 62 hectares plants, which is, um, which is crazy. But it's, it's out, outstanding. We have converted the, the estate in uh, organic uh, in February 2019. I could do that even before signing. So um, yeah, we will be in conversion next year and fully organic in uh, two years. Um, Jill uh, says that she visited you, Jill Barth, she visited you a few years ago at St. Combe and was fascinated by the Roman art artifacts that are in the cellar. But this is, this is also a very old Roman winemaking place, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, uh, it's both saint Com and, and Rouen are Roman, but in Rouen, it was, uh, it was richer people because uh, the, 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 the potential of the place, the agricultural potential was bigger. And uh, what we found in the ground, the rest of the tiles, the rest of column, columns, and uh, many, many potteries and things like that talk about uh, a richer population. Uh, Gigondas was more, a, a little more rustic, a little more, more poor. Mm. Um, well, thank you for introducing the estate. Um, just to keep our presentation moving, uh, and I never like to rush with you, Louis, so I, I always like to hear you um, talk. So I hate to rush, but do you want to taste? Maybe we should taste with, uh, uh, starting with the um, Les Deux Albion Blanc, uh, which is a very, uh, ex also an exciting new project. It's relatively new for you. 
Yeah, this Albion, this Albion white, uh, this is vineyard that I, uh, this is a, a project we did uh, by ourselves 100%. This place uh, had a right in the 17th century, a special royal right to make white. Uh, I found that in uh, ancient documents. But nowadays, this place is, was totally abandoned uh, for a long time. So um, I could buy this place. This is literally in the immediate neighborhood of Gigondas. You have Gigondas and then the river and then this place. And nobody was cultivating vines anymore in this place because uh, the level of limestone is so crazy that the vines struggle to, uh, to grow. But this is why there was a royal right in this place because in such a limestone place, the expression of white can only be good. So I, I, I bought this place for a relatively low price because nobody wanted it. And I began to do 260 tons of compost every year to re-establish a life in the soil and re-establish a, a balance, an equilibrium in this soil. And after two years of preparation, we planted Selection Massal of uh, Viognier, Marsan, Picpoul, Claret, Uni Blanc, Bourboulinque. And uh, our first vintage was 16. So that's just the, the, the fourth vintage, really, of this uh, young vineyard. But this is... Uh, young vineyard made of uh, old vineyards. So this is young, old. Uh, and, um, and yeah, the, the, the result is nice because of the, the level of limestone. So there's quite a, a, a good amount of mineral. And this is all made basically like a Grand Cru. I mean, this is all picked in little cases. This is pressed for four hours in the press, slowly, gently. This is a strong debourbage. This is a, fermented with indigenous yeast in an uh, old cask. Uh, we, do, we do a really big job on this one. It, it, the Viognier comes through, of course, because uh, Viognier has a lot of personality, but it's such a different expression of Viognier than, uh, than Condrieu, uh, which is flinty and smoky. The, the minerality is so different here. It's salty. It's the, most, the main thing I get from this wine is the salinity of it. It's, it's so mineral. Yeah, I mean, Viognier is a bit like me. It's too noisy, you see. It, it talks too much. So when you put it with other grapes, it always talks more than the others. Um, I try to improve that, I promise. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, Viognier is just uh, 30%, but it's, it's very expressive. My guess is that with time, it, it's going to disappear. With time, Viognier is going to deliver more mineral, less fruit, and the other grapes are going to take over with the aromatic spectrum. We, are, we see that already with 18. Um, you might, uh, the audience might find it interesting that you've planted a grape variety here called St. Combe. The name of the grape is St. Combe, and would you just say yeah. a few words about that? Yeah, you know, uh, I have to... I have to go back in history a little bit. One minute. Um, you know, we had the phylloxera in 1870 in France. Almost the entire uh, French vineyard disappeared. Before that, every region had its indigenous grapes. There were many, 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 many different grapes. If you open the book uh, written by Mr. Ribeiro Gaillon, which is the Recueil d'Empélographie, uh, a fantastic analogist from uh, Bordeaux. You can see this, those hundreds of grapes used in France uh, before the phylloxera. When the phylloxera destroyed the vineyards and, the, and people decided to replant, what did they decide? They decided to go for the best grape or what they considered being the, the best grapes. But more important, the grapes they were making the most money with. So that might mean high yielding, bit more alcohol, more of this, more of that, not necessarily quality. 
But what happened is that we lost a lot of diversity after the phylloxera. Uh, this is when Chardonnay took over all the other grapes uh, in Burgundy. This is when uh, we planted Grenache like crazy in the Rhone because Grenache produces a lot, make alcohol, and uh, is never ill, and the growers love it, right? Because the growers are like everyone, they like Monet, you see? And, um, and, and, and this is, it was a, a move, a big change, which was not necessarily a fantastic change. And there, here and there, you still find those ancient grapes, uh, sometimes in very, very small quantity. Some have disappeared. And uh, uh, it appears that there is a grape called Sancrum, which is the name of our estate. And it is a native from Aveyron area, which is in the southwest of France. And there is still 2.5 hectares, no more. It's almost finished. So we decided to go select only sane individuals. So we have been testing many vines with the viruses and things. Uh, we did that uh, um, seriously. And we selected uh, three or four different plants because we didn't have many to deal with. They were all ill. I mean, all full of viruses. And you don't want to multiplicate, uh, multiplicate ill vines. So we had three or four, and we multiplicated that. So this is a, not a wide selection massal, but still a selection massal. So we multiplicated, planted 0.5 hectares of synchrome in Les Deux Albion uh, synchrome. <laughs> and uh, we will have our first production this year. So this year we have a couple of barrels of pure synchrome. And um, so that was a big work, was complicated, etc. And I re nev never really thought about the wine it would give. And one day my son, uh, James, uh, little James, uh, who is now 23, told me, but dad, if, if, if the wine is bad, what are you going to do? Uh, and I said, uh, well, uh, I don't know. We'll see. Um, so that was interesting. But, um, well, I mean, my experience of this is that if you work really well, uh, if you do your best, a grape, even an, an average grape, will always deliver a little something nice. The, the audience is really enjoying the nature of St. Combe right now because we can hear the beautiful birds outside. It's very nice. It's very nice you atmosphere. Can hear them. <laughs> yeah, it's nice though. Oh, really? <laughs> this is a nightingale. Uh, uh, it, it, it's crazy. No, usually the nightingales only sing at night, but this one sing night and day. It's crazy. I've never seen that. It's beautiful. And uh, Louis, there's three, three people have asked the same question. Uh, they'd like to know uh, the meaning of Les Deux Albions. Do you, do you wish to share the meaning of the, the name of the wine, Les Deux Albions? Yeah, Albion is, is the old name of uh, England. Albion, okay. Albion comes from the Latin word Alba, because like, the coast of Albatre in England is very limestoney. So Albion means limestone. It, mean, it means England as well. My wife, Cherie, is English. Uh, and Plateau d'Albion is the area where my, my father comes from. So Albion to us means uh, a lot. So it has become uh, pretty much our second family name. So we have decided to call this place uh, Deux Albion. And um, yeah, that's the story. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> We want to taste, uh, of course, the, the flagship wine of your estate uh, together. And it's the Gigandos. We have pictured here the 2018, what I actually have in my uh, glasses, the 2017. But I think it's fine. We can have a good discussion maybe about vintages because these two vintages are, are very different. Uh, they made very different styles of wine, 2017, 2018. Yeah. Sacrum, uh Sancrum is a very sensitive place to uh, vintages because it's a very, very cold corner in, um, in the Southern Round. For example, Chateauneuf du Pape peaks in mid-September. We usually peak between the 5 and the 10 of October. So that's a massive difference because of the elevation. 
because of the, the, the fact we are at the bottom of the valley, we, we watch north, northwest, and, uh, and it makes the ripening of the Grenache and Saint-Combe very slow and very long, which is a very good idea. Um, so the cold microclimate tend to express the vintages on a very precise way. Because in a hot year, it's gonna be hot, like everywhere. In a cold year, it's gonna be terrible. It's gonna ripe late, it's go you're gonna get rot, it's gonna be more difficult. In an average, in a, in a normal year, you're gonna get a lot of balance. So the, the variation of expression is, is very big. I mean, if you, uh, if you put side by side uh, 16, 17, 18, 19, you have four very different wines, very different. But, but I really like this. I mean, sometimes the customers say, oh, Louis, they kind of complain and say, oh, Louis, the wine is different from last year. How am I going to explain that to the customers? I, I, I like to answer, uh, you should be really happy about that because the nature gives you a different wine every year. And you, and you don't need marketing people to think about designing new, new ideas or whatever. The nature gives you that uh, and you have nothing to do. So let's, let's be happy with this then our job as winemakers is to, uh, is to potentialize um, uh, the, 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 the nature of a vintage, for sure. And we have to deal with the conditions proposed by nature. But we, we, we don't want to go against nature. You, you don't want to go uh, too ripe when the, the vintage is cold. When the vintage is, is hotter, you go a little riper maybe. But, uh, but you, you, have to, you have to follow nature. It's always a better idea when you make nature your friend. When you fight nature, it's not a good idea. Gigondas is um, it's higher in elevation than, than the other famous appellation of the Southern Rhone, Chateauneuf de Pop. It's limestone base. Uh, many, yeah. of, many of the vineyards face north. There's many different yeah, it, expositions. It it's north, northwest. It's mostly limestone. Uh, it's cold. It's late. Uh, it's it's a geology of mother rock. When Chateau Neuf is a geology of uh, uh, alluvions, ancient alluvions. Uh, so basically, except the grape Grenache, we have nothing in common. Let's let's face it. We have nothing in common. But we are just 15 kilometers away. But there's there's no comparison. I mean those. Those who are listening today who came in our region uh, and compared really, really can understand that. Um, it's, 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 it's kind of crazy. Well, when I taste your Gigandas, it, it's almost like I'm tasting, uh, it's like a Gigandas, but a Burgundy or something. It has a different sensibility about it. Is it the, is it the Appalachian or is it your uh, sensibility? the way you approach the wine because it's so fin it's so much on the finesse and freshness this is what i always find about your your wines in general but chicken especially yeah i think you know wine is 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 complex it's always a, a mix of reasons uh but yes the, the natural conditions the soil the climate uh make make a a, a difference Saint-Com is very very different from the other gigondas uh usually uh, and I would say that, yes, our work uh, make a difference as well. The, the, the ancient cellar where the, we, we never use chemicals, we have all these fantastic populations of indigenous yeast living in the cellar. We don't pick uh, overripe. We, uh, um, we are being very, very simple with what we do. Uh, we have been designing and improving our methods over like 70 years. It's not a, it's not a few years work. Uh, my father really began to improve the level of the estate in the beginning of the 60s. So it's a, it's a really long and collective work. Yeah, Keith and Ryan are asking very similar questions. And I know this isn't an easy thing to answer in a few sentences, but how is Grenache different on Tortonian soil versus uh, sandy soil versus limestone? How is the taste different on these different soil types? 
Oh, that's that's uh, that's really interesting when you taste all the Lyodi in the Cellar. Um, the sands, the, the, the sands from the Mulsen Sea are deposits, okay? And it appears that it's a fantastic uh, soil for Grenache grape. The sands tend to give refined wines with great depth, uh, with very round and friendly tannins, I would say. Um, but it's complex because you take the sand from the Mioseine in Baume de Venise, in Rayas, in Massif du Chaux, or in saint Combe, you get uh, four very different wines. So explain entirely the wine with the soil is interesting, but it's a dangerous exercise. Uh, uh, the, the limestone in Mar from Mioseine give maybe a little more rustic wines, but wines with more, uh, uh, they are larger. Uh, the aromatic spectrum is totally different. With the sands, you are on the little, the cherries, the little red fruits. With the limestone in Mar, this is the, 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 the cold ash. The, the chimini, the coal, the graphite, all these things. And the tort onion, uh, which is le poste, uh, gives the most feminine uh, gigondas of, uh, of, of the estate. It's, it's extremely refined. Um, it's, uh, uh, it flies more. And uh, it's usually a lot more floral and you find uh, quite constantly the violet and the peony in the wine. And um, one, one final question before we move on to Chateau Rouen. The, the Gigandas 2018, uh, can you describe how it's different from 2017? Uh, I, I know the vintage was very warm, so I, I assume it's riper, it has a, a bigger fruit. A profile, but you should explain it to us. The 2018 versus the 2017 Gigondas. Uh, 17 was uh, was a very very low crop, um, and so the tannins might take a, a few years to really round perfectly. Uh, it's a wine of great intensity. It reminds me a little bit of 05 as a vintage. It's a really good vintage. 18 uh, is a higher yield, uh, it, it, it ripe later, and we find again the, the, the Burgundian, uh, the Burgundian uh, uh, characters that you find uh, sometimes uh, in, uh, in Saint-Combe Gigondas wines. But so, if you tasted them side by side, you couldn't believe how different they are. No. Thank you, uh, Bernard, I'm for that. I'm not responsible for that. <laughs> yeah, it's the vintage. Um, exactly. Bernard, thank you for the, the question. And Louis, thank you for the uh, answer. I think we should move on to speak about uh, Van Sobre and uh, Chateau de Rouen, uh, which I have the 2018 to taste with you. So I'll taste it. Okay. Sorry, I'm not, I'm, not tasting the, I'm not tasting the reds tonight because the, the temperature here is, is, is really warm. It's, it's be, the, basically the summer began yesterday. We had the 29 uh, Celsius today. So really nice and warm. So sorry, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not drinking the reds. I'm, I'm, I'm drinking this. Ah, very nice, perfect. <laughs> I have that in my uh, cellar. And um, the reds, by the way, I'm, uh, I just, Took them from our, my wine fridge right before our interview started and it's uh, I have my wine fridge set to 55 degrees Fahrenheit and it's really um, the wines uh, show really really well at that slightly cooler temperature. Yeah. Uh, so uh, to talk about uh, uh, wines of Rouen now um, we should talk about the, the, the present and uh, maybe a little bit about the future as well because I'm just taking over this place. Um, I, I co-vinified 18 and I vinified 19 by myself entirely. Uh, so you'll see, uh, you rapidly see a lot of move in uh, our offers, uh, in the wines we are, gonna, we are gonna propose because I want to uh, give, give the, my customers 
a really nice translation of this place. So it's, 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 it's like when you translate um, what somebody says in another language, you, want, you really want to be honest and stick to what is being said. For me to make wine is the same. You don't want to say something yourself. You want to translate uh, uh, what a place has to say. And uh, it's really sad when a place is, is badly translated. Okay, it, it doesn't give uh, uh, a proper image of what it is. So uh, that's, that's, that's my goal really. So uh, in 18, I, uh, I covinified the, the vintage with, uh, with the, the previous owner who is a friend from uh, when we were 14 years old. I mean, the previous owner, we went to school together. We were in a boarding school, a, a Catholic boarding school. And uh, so we know for a long time. Uh, it's really crazy what life proposes sometimes. Um, so we co we vinified 18 together. And this uh, Chateau de Rouen, uh, Vin Sobre 18, is basically a blend of the, the, the best that. It's, uh, it's about uh, one quarter of what the estate can make in terms of volume. So that's, there is not all the vineyards in this bottle. Uh, there is um, what, what, what we had and was very, very nice. Bear in mind, 18 was, was not an easy vintage. Uh, it's, uh, it was a relatively difficult vintage to, uh, to begin with, but this wine is, uh, contains 50% Grenache and then Mourvedre and Syrah, 25-25. Uh, it really reflects the, 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 the slope which is behind the, the castle and, uh, and it's, made, uh, it's made in concrete tanks with indigenous yeast, it's full bunches, uh, there are a few ideas that I carry with me uh, because they are the, 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 the foundations of my, uh, of my methods. Um, and uh, we, we age that in, uh, in concrete, uh, very, very simple with a few oxygen. And the wine is unfiltered. Uh, Van Sobre is 30 kilometers north of Gigandas. You've called it uh, the Northern Rhone of the South uh, because Syrah loves this place. And um, I had a question, of, I had my own question about Syrah here at uh, Chateau de Rouen. I know you have a fondness for Serene. Uh, do you have Serene planted here at uh, Rouen? Yes, because all the, all the Syrah from, uh, from Rouen have been planted in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and the, the clones arrived in France in uh, 78. So every vineyard planted before 78 are Selection Massal. And the Selection Massal of Syrah can only be serene. So that's, that's uh, the 25% the that you have in your glass are serene. Thank you for that. And you, you made a comment to James Molesworth about uh, this vineyard, uh, Rouen, reminding you of Claude Lambre in Maury Saint Denis. Uh, and I, I'm thinking about that while I taste the wine and it's, it maybe is your suggestion, but it is so uh, Burgundian. It's so fresh and elegant. Yeah, the, the freshness is, 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 comes on the very natural way here because you always have to remember nine kilometers from Rouen, this is where the Alps begin. Seven kilometers from Rouen, there is a town called Nyons, which is a cold place because it takes all the cold air from the valleys coming from the Alps. And behind Nyons, you see big mountains. And then this is only the Alps until Torino, Milano, and Chamonix. It's only big mountains. So the winds, they go over the Alps and they arrive basically in Vinsobre very cold and they regulate like a crazy uh, the, the, the temperatures and the ripening. It's a, it's a wonderful microclimate. Uh, but the, expo the exposure to sun is southeast. It's the extreme opposite of Saint-Combe. 
Sengkong is northwest, Rouen is southeast. Mm. Uh, it's totally different. So my vineyard in Rouen watches the light of the sunrise. My vineyard in, in, in Gigondas watch the light of the sunset. So it's a, it's a very different treatment for the vineyards because the light of the morning has nothing to do with the light of the night. And it, it, gives, it gives different profiles. So uh, this freshness comes naturally and, and we work to preserve this balance and, 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 and this freshness. So you will never have uh, reds from Rouen which will be uh, uh, heavy, uh, overripe uh, wines. Even if I wanted to do that, I think I couldn't. Um, and you farm St. Combe biodynamically and you are converting uh, uh, Chateau de Rouen to biodynamics. And Jeremy is asking if you have any interest in biodynamic certification. Well, it's, it's a question I answer uh, many times, I mean, all the time. Again, if you read the brochure 2020, there is a text, um, there is a text about, about this, this subject. Um, I, uh, I, I, I like some of the methods in biodynamic and I use uh, a good amount of them but the way they have regulated biodynamic in France, I think has been uh, um, a little ideologic as uh, they decided that the same rules would apply to Champagne and to Gigondas. When Champagne looks like the climate of the Finger Lakes and Gigondas uh, is a Mediterranean climate. So at the moment you have to use silica on vineyards in July. It's a good practice in Champagne. It's, it's a catastrophic practice in the Southern Rome. So I cannot, uh, I cannot certify with uh, a, 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 a group of regulations which I don't fully like. And one day, uh, some very well-known people at the head of the biodynamic movements and told me, oh, but Louis, do the silica in winter. It has no impact in the vines and you can certify. So I said, but so you want me to lie, do something, lie to people, say, oh yeah, I do this, I do that, and I don't do it. And then I have the, the medal, like a, like a Russian general in the 60s. <laughs> um, and uh, I said, so this is where our roads get different. So yes. they have their road, I respect, but I have my road. And my road is using biodynamic uh, methods, not all of them, and as well, the methods of my father. Because he has been working a lot on the life in the soils, the structure of the soils, how to deal with uh, the, the moon when we prune, when we plant, when we bottle the wines, we bought all the wines at the right moon, etc. So Sancom is not uh, certified biodynamic. We are on our own. I certify organic because it's a guarantee for the consumer that our wines are clean. But uh, I will never certify uh, biodynamic. There's a few more uh, questions and we have maybe about 10 minutes left as we We'll try to answer those questions, but I wanted uh, a chance for Louis to introduce a brand new wine to the U.S. market. Uh, this is from Rouen, and this is a first for me. I don't know if you made sparkling wine in the past, and it was just a secret. Sometimes Louis makes the secret wines, and you have to go visit him to find out about them. But <laughs> <laughs> this is, um, this is uh, our first introduction to this wine in the U.S. Uh, this is the Rouen Brut Nature, and I'll open it while you explain it. Yeah, so, um, that's, uh, that's the one. I'm gonna taste this one. Um, in Vin Sobre, in Rouen, we have, uh, the bottom of the property is uh, so cold that uh, it's, it's not, um, it's not really usable for, 
for doing vin sobre wines. Uh, but there is a there is a, an old tradition of uh, sparkling in the Grignan County. Comté de Grignan is an historical place. We are part of this historical county, and uh, having all these cold winds from the Alps, uh, we have a real great potential to make brut nature rosé. Um, so I decided to. Um, to begin uh, in um, 2019 and do some um, uh, because it's fun, because it's a new challenge, because it really sticks to the potential of the place. There is a truth, there is a reality. Uh, the wine is 12 alcohol, to give you an idea of how cold we are. And um, another idea pushed me to do that is that, you know, until the 80s, there was not a region in the world who was demonstrating the uh, 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 rosé could be great. Rosé was considered uh, a sub-wine, uh, under-wine. And suddenly the people in Provence uh, developed new technologies, new ideas, etc. And they, they become owners of the rosé category. And it appears that the, the great rosés in France are made in the South. Normally, we, we should think that rosé has to have freshness and then it should come from the, the northern part of the country. But it didn't happen. And the best rosé in France are made in Provence. And I, I really have this idea that the sparkling rosés could have the same story. Because if you a part of uh, a few champagnes, who are great rosé, most of the rosé sparkling are not always great, I would say. Um, and I think there is a, a massive potential in this region of the south, which is a, a, a cold microclimate. So my idea is to explore uh, uh, this, uh, this potential. I will do my best to, uh, to produce uh, great wines. This is uh, our first uh, Vintage, I think it's a, it's a success. I, I got a little bit of help for that. Um, a help of a very high pedigree from uh, Champagne uh, because it's a, it's a new job for me and I didn't want to, uh, to lose time. And I discovered uh, an incredible world. For me, at uh, uh, 51 years old, uh, begin again with a, with a new uh, a new discipline in my job is really invigorating. Uh, I really love it. I love to learn. Uh, I love to feel that uh, I knew nothing about that, and um, and I'll try to have a a strong learning curve. So this first version of um, Brut Nature Rouen, first Brut Nature means there is no sugar. Okay, so there is no dosage. There is no liqueur d'expédition. It's dry, bone dry, like we say in the Finger Lakes. Um, the grapes are 50% Mourvèdre, and then Syrah, Grenache, Marcelin, and 15% saint -Saux. So this blend might move a little bit in the future because uh, I think I'm, I might use uh, some white grapes as well in the blend. So we, we will explore that in uh, 2020. But um, yeah, we are happy about this first version, especially about the fruit it develops. The nose, uh, I don't know if some of you have the wine, but uh, I find a lot of uh, cherry bone, the bone of the cherry, which mixes with uh, silex. So there is a mineral dimension and this uh, really nice, uh, uh, aroma of cherry and, and cherry bone. And uh, I quite like it because sometimes the rose is sparkling. I mean, they, they don't sometimes have much fruit. And I think uh, at this price in this style, you need, uh, you need a good quantity of uh, immediate pleasure. I mean, the sparklings are the wines of joy, of parties, of uh, enjoying life with your friends. It, uh, it's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be complicated. It has to be pleasant and it has to carry a lot of energy. 
I think we need all of that at the moment. Don't you think so, Jesse? Yes, I agree. I'm imagining that I'll come visit you at Rouen sometime in the future and you will greet, greet us with this um, fantastic new sparkling. So thank you for introducing it today. Um, we have lots of questions. We'll try to answer as many as we can. Uh, I can answer the question for Vinay. How do I get a copy of the, the booklet that Louis mentioned? Louis's uh, newsletter is on his website and you can download it there. I, it's a fantastic read, so I recommend it. Or you can, you can contact us, or me, and I'll, I'll ha be happy to send it to you. And Sarah Matthews, Louis, is asking if you've had time to play your music during the quarantine. <laughs> yes, I, uh, I played a lot of music since uh, my, my children who are 23, 21 and 15. They are all musicians. Um, they had to come back and it has been the longest time all together for a long time that we had. And uh, that allowed us to do a lot of music uh, together. So yes, that's, that's a good aspect of, uh, of quarantine because uh, Usually when the, the life is normal, I work so much that uh, music is a, is a little too forgotten sometimes. Uh, Rebecca, my colleague at Craft and Estate says that we will send everyone a follow-up email with the link to your newsletter. So that's perfect. And I think Marty has a great question. Um, why, if, if Rouen is such a cold place, why is there um, so much Morvedra planted there? Doesn't Morvedra need a warm? So much warm. Morvedra, it's my accent, it's terrible. Morvedra, why is there so much Morvedra at, um, at Rouen? Because it's a cold place and Morvedra needs warmth to ripen. Yeah, but uh, I, I actually, it's, a, it's, it's actually a really good question. Um, I would stick to, uh, I would give my confidence to our grandfathers. I didn't plant those Morvedra. These, those Mourvedre have been planted in the 60s. So um, maybe until the 70s, they struggled to, to ripe those vines. Probably I, uh, I should uh, go back in the, in the papers, in the records, because I have all the records of the estate. I should go back in the records to, to check that. Very good question, by the way. And, uh, but what I can say uh, in uh, both 18 and 19, Mourvedre uh, ripe. Uh, yes, we picked by the 12th of October. We picked very late, but they ripe. We reached 12.5 alcohol, but the, the, the bunches were physiolog physiologically really ripe. So it, uh, it really worked. Uh, in a very cold vintage, I think we would really struggle, if I am honest. But what was uh, uh, a, a little impressive is that it ripened pretty much at the same time as the Grenache. And this is unusual. In Gigondas, for example, my Mourvedre ripes much later the, uh, after, the, Mourved, after the, 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 the Grenache. It depends on the age of the, age of the vines, it depends on the yields, it depends on, um, on many things, but... Um, Given that we are in a global warming process, I think having some Mourvedre in a, even a cold place is, a, is not a bad idea for the future. And John was asking if you prefer to work with natural yeast for all of your wines, do you ever inoculate for fermentation? No, we, uh, it's one of the few ideas I, I stick to. Um, Indigenous yeast give so much soul to the wines. They give the character, the intensity, and they make the wine don't look like the neighbor's wine. Uh, the, the, I used to inoculate sometimes with the Deux Albion white when I had a, a, a little of a high alcohol with Viognier. Then the indigenous, the indigenous struggle to finish the the fermentation, I used to do that, but now I have solved this problem by pre-blending Picpoul with Viognier. Then uh, Viognier might be 14.5, Picpoul is gonna be 11. By blending them at Debourbage, I end up with a 13, 
and 13 is doable with indigenous. So basically, uh, it's, a, it's a quite long time I haven't inoculated uh, 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 a juice. Thank you, Louis. And I think this is a nice final question for you. Um, so Michael is asking you, you make gigondas, You've, you make wines in the Finger Lakes, you make wines, I'll add this, you make wines in the Northern Rhone as well and in Chateauneuf de Pop. Ben, so, so he's asking if champagne is next. Uh, champagne, uh, uh, wait. Champagne is the project of my uh, great, great, great grandfather. Wow. <laughs> you were prepared for that. For that. Amazing. No, it's, uh, it's, it's, it won't be a project. Uh, I, am a, I am a big champagne lover. Um, it's a region I, I deeply love. I have a lot of friends there. I am a friend of uh, uh, Pascal Agrappard. I am a friend of Jean-Hervé Chiquet from Jacqueson. Um, I love the region, but no, it's, uh, it's far away. It's, um, I prefer to uh, do a big work on my Brut Nature Rosé in Rouen. If I can achieve something very nice there, it's, uh, I'll be very happy with that. Louis, I wanted to um, thank you for spending this time. Thanks for being so generous and for being so, uh, so transparent and, and just answering all of our questions. Uh, this was uh, very enlightening. We, we all learned something tonight. So thank you, Louis. I, I wanted to end with a, a beautiful picture of the, the St. Combe Chapel and Le Post, but um, I, I can't say enough. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Uh Jesse, thank you very much. You, you have been a, a, a fantastic uh, moderator. You, you made my job uh, very, very easy because it's not that easy to speak in front of a, a screen. Um, I just want to say to uh, uh, our friends from the US, um, uh, be strong, be... Uh, 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 be sure that everything is going to come to normal uh, uh, sooner than we sooner that we think, and uh, and um, uh, I really miss uh, the U.S. Uh, I come to the U.S. usually three or four times a year. I I, I really like to come uh, always, and um, I I I really miss it. I I just wanted to. Uh, to say that, and I'll be so happy to uh, to come back when it's going to be um, uh, possible. So I wish you to uh, 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 enjoy uh, uh, good time when things go back to to normal, and uh, and we have a glass of, of wine together. Fantastic, Louis Brol, Thank you so much, uh, and to the audience, thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, this has been a conversation with Louis Barol uh, from St. Colm in Gigondas. Thank you again. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.